So you've picked up a Broadlink Universal Remote, and you're able to control lots of devices that use infrared. But recently, you've decided to self-host a lot of your services. And this doesn't play well with Broadlink devices. Broadlink devices want to be cloud connected. But if you'd like to regain control of your Broadlink devices on your local network, well, I've built something you can self-host within your own infrastructure. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're going to talk about self-hosting your own Broadlink control. As a quick reminder, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you want to continue the conversation about home automation there, we can. So let's talk about self-hosting a Broadlink service. So first of all, why would I use one of these devices? Well, if you're like most people, you have lots of remote controls for a lot of your dumb devices. Those dumb devices communicate over infrared. And most of those devices don't have any smart features. And even if they do have some smart features, they're tucked behind infrared commands. So at the end of the day, you have to end up using a remote control. And that remote control will send the appropriate infrared command. And unless you're using a smart device like we're going to talk about, there's not an easy way to automate this. So that's where the Broadlink Universal Remote comes in. This device is small, compact, and is loaded with features. It claims to support over 50,000 IR devices, which is quite a bit. And they host a database of known devices and known commands. But then you also have the option to teach this device. You can put the device in learning mode and teach it some commands. And once the device learns the command, you can send the command. But the nice part is you can send that command from an app. But here's where the problem is. You see that when you go through the initial setup and add a device, it will scan for new devices. Once it finds a device, you have to supply your Wi-Fi credentials. And you also have to give it your location information. Then once it discovers and configures that device, it will add it to your account. And at this point, the device is cloud connected only, which for some people that might be fine. And if you don't mind having a cloud connected device, you can add that device to your account, teach it some commands and use it through the app. But if you do mind that it's only connected to the cloud and you don't have local access, we have a couple of options. But first, let me share with you how I use this device. So if you've joined some of my live streams, you've noticed the colored lights in the background. Most of those lights are Philips Hue lights, but I do have a few no-name RGB lights. These lights are pretty popular with streamers. And if you recognize this remote, you know which ones I'm talking about. And it gives you some decent color and brightness options. But these lights are not smart at all. I've made these semi-smart by plugging them into a smart plug. And with that smart plug, I can turn them on and off. But that doesn't give me any control over the brightness or color. And so usually I have to climb over the couch back there and change the color or change the brightness. Sometimes I can angle it just right to turn them on and off. But that's not the main reason why I wanted to pick up one of these remote controls. You see, recently in my stream, I gave my viewers the ability to change the light color in my room. And I do this all through channel points. So I have a bot in my channel that listens for a point redemption. I have some custom code that'll change the Philips Hue lights. And then I also wanted to change the hue of these RGB lights. And that's when I went down this rabbit hole of trying to find a device that could send out IR commands. Turns out, these devices are pretty popular. It seems like most people use these to control some of your appliances at home and possibly your TV or basically anything with infrared. But I had the idea to change the lights in my room and I wanted to wire that up to my point redemption so that when someone changes the color or the theme of my stream, they would also change these lights. And after that rabbit hole, that led into another. I wanted to do this programmatically. So I searched for a lot of solutions out there. You see, I needed an API where I can do this, where I could wire this up to my bot. And a lot of the solutions that were out there were either outdated, didn't work, or required for me to implement a whole entire system. <laughs> now I get it. Home Assistant can do this and Home Assistant is awesome. And recently they've added support for a lot of these devices. And if you're already using Home Assistant, that's a great solution for you. I highly recommend it. But I needed something a little bit different and a little lighter weight. Like I said, I need an API that my bot can call out to to change. But if you're not running Home Assistant or need a lightweight API, you can check out what I built and add it to your home lab today. So today, in this video, we're going to set up a self-hosted Broadlink control. This is a control that I built over the last couple of weeks, but I wanted to share it with you. It's a combination of a front end and an API all hosted within a Docker container. And I have to admit that a lot of this would not be possible without the open source contributions to Home Assistant. I'm using some of their open source libraries in my project. So thanks Home Assistant. You ready to spin this up? Okay, 
So with that out of the way, let's get started. The first thing you want to do is go out to my GitHub repo. This is github.com slash techno dash Tim. And here you want to look at the techno broadlink repo. Once you're in the techno broadlink repo, you'll see my source code. So I know the documentation is kind of light right now, but by the time I release this video, I'll add some more to it. But once you're in this repo, you'll see the simple Docker commands. You knew I was going to build it on Docker, didn't you? And if you're running plain old Docker, you can see the Docker commands here. First, we're going to run Docker run. This environment variable is very important. This is the environment variable of your Docker host. And we need this to do network discovery, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Next, we're going to publish some ports, so 8080 on the outside and 8080 on the inside. Then we're going to map a volume to our config, and that will be the host path to the containers path of app slash config. Next, we're going to use the host network, and this is important too. This is because we need to discover these devices on our network. Next, we're going to use host-based networking, and this is really important too. We need this so we can discover our Broadlink devices. And next is the name of our Docker image. And that's Timothy Stewart 6 slash techno dash Broadlink. And if we wanted to spin this up with plain old Docker, we could run this command and we'd have it here in a couple of minutes. But I'm going to move on to Rancher. And if you're not familiar with Rancher, Rancher is an easy way to spin up Docker and Kubernetes. If you need help setting it up, I've got a complete tutorial that will walk you through setting up Docker, Rancher, and Kubernetes in just a couple of minutes. But if you're using something else like Portainer, QNAP, Synology, or any other UI over Docker, you can follow these next screens and most of them will apply. So once we're in our Rancher server, we'll want to go to Cluster, Default Cluster, and here we'll see all of our workloads we have set up. So we'll want to create a new workload, so let's click Deploy. First, we'll want to name this workload. I name mine Techno-Broadlink. Next, we'll want to specify the Docker image. That's Timothy Stewart 6 Techno-Broadlink. Next, we'll want to add some ports. Here, we'll want to publish port 8080. I'm also going to use host port to make this easier. Next, we'll want to create an environment variable of host underscore IP, and we'll want to set the value of our Rancher server. This helps with discovery and also routes requests for our UI. And while we're doing networking, we should probably configure the host-based networking. Let's click Show Advanced and go into Networking, and here we'll select Use Host Network Namespace. Now, this is really important to discover our Broadlink devices. And it's kind of redundant to add port mapping and host-based networking at the same time, because host-based networking overrides any ports you've passed in. But we'll keep this here for the sake of the tutorial. Next, we'll need to create a volume. So let's click Add Volume. I'm going to use by mount a directory from a node. And if you are using a directory from a node, we'll actually need to create a folder on our server. So you'll want to remote into your server, then you'll want to create a folder called techno-broadlink, and you'll want to copy that mapping to your clipboard. So for volume name, we're going to use config, and path on node, we're going to use the one that was on our clipboard, and then our mount point within the container is slash app slash config. Okay, now we can click launch, and it's running. So if you want to use your device with local access, we'll need to do a couple of things. If you've already fully added the device to Broadlink, we'll need to remove it. Once you remove it from the app, we'll need to hard reset the device. You can do that by pushing in a little clip until the device factory resets. Once it does, you'll want to make sure it's in pairing mode. You'll know it's in pairing mode because the LED will be flashing really fast. Once it's in pairing mode, you have a couple of options. If you're concerned about security and understand Python, you can use a Python utility to send your password to the device or you can partially set up the device within the app. So to partially set up the device in the app, you would launch the app, then you would click Add Device and have it scan for your device, then it would discover your device, then you'll need to add your Wi-Fi network and your Wi-Fi network password so it can send it to the device, then you'll need to give it access to location, at least temporarily, then once you see your device on this screen, don't do anything else. You don't want to add your device to your account. Once you do this, it'll be cloud only. So the best thing to do is just force close the app and we'll go from there. And here's our UI and it already discovered our device. Now, I know that this is pretty simple, but I needed a couple of things. One, most importantly, I needed an API. So I actually built an API that's behind this. And I was going to stop there, but then I figured, well, why not create a UI really quick that we can connect to the API and serve the data out? And even though I just need the API, I figured there'd be people who needed the UI piece as well. So anyways, we can find our device here. It's automatically named Room, but we can change this. And we've renamed that device. And we can try discovering for more devices. So if you add another one, you can discover again. And then here in this command section is where we can actually teach our device commands. 
So we don't have any listed now, so let's click plus and we'll get this dialog for what we want to name our command. Now you can name these anything you like, but I highly recommend a naming scheme like device and then the command. So here I'm naming this RGB on. And once we click learn, this will put the device in learning mode. Once we put the device in learning mode, the device's LED will turn on. Once it turns on, press a command on your remote and it'll learn that command. So I'm gonna teach this RGB on. Okay, so we taught it one command, let's teach it off. Let's teach it blue, now let's teach it red. Okay, now that we've taught it some commands, we can actually send these commands to the device. So let's turn my RGB on first. Let's send the on command, and there we go, it turned on, so it's blue in here, so let's change it to red, and there's red, and let's turn it off, and there it goes, it's off. So I know this is a very simple UI, but it actually took a lot of time to figure out all of these pieces. And I'll admit, I'm no Python expert at all. This was my first time ever writing Python. So I'd love a pull request to help out. And so you can continue to use this UI if you like. The cool thing about this too, is I actually persist this data. So if we run an LS, we should see a JSON file. And in that JSON is the model for this device along with all of our commands. But as I mentioned before, I needed an API more than I needed a UI for this because I would like to send these commands in code. And so if you don't want to use my UI, I created an API too. And I created a Postman collection too for you to test it out. So if you're not familiar with Postman, Postman's an easy way to send web requests to an API. And if you import this Postman collection, you can send these commands to the API that's running. And I can send a learn command to it and it learned our command. If I go back to the UI, I should see this command called techno time. Then we can send the command from the UI. Or if we grab the ID from Postman for that new command, we can send it from here too. And we see success. And now you can see how powerful these devices are. And worth mentioning again, this is not as full featured as Home Assistant. I just needed an API that I can use for my stream. And if you want something more full featured, I highly recommend checking out Home Assistant. Because like I said before, none of this would be possible without Home Assistant. They created an API and a CLI for discovering and configuring Broadlink devices. And I pulled it in as a dependency. So thanks Home Assistant. Okay, let's, let's turn these off. So what do you think about using Broadlink devices offline? Are there ways that you can use this API to tie into some of your code? Or are you already using something like this with Home Assistant? Do you think I've gone too far down the rabbit hole with this? If so, let me know in the comments section below. And while you're down there, don't forget to give this video a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, so if you have a question about this video or any of my other videos, hop in my stream and I'd love to have you. So, thanks so much for watching and till next time, stream on my friend. Where's the, like, is there a faster version of this? Um, maybe not? Anyways, um, I have some stuff coming. <laughs> it all goes back to, this, this has been a long journey for me. I think a month and a half ago, someone's like, why don't we change the color of the lights in here? I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And um, that put me down this path of writing code for Philips Hue, um, trying to find an IR blaster, finding one, but then realizing that IR blaster is cloud only connected, then realizing Home Assistant folks figured out some stuff uh, to make it not only uh, cloud connected. Uh, and then I've been working, um, had some help from someone from Home Assistant, uh, I contributed stuff to their project. I got something coming. So anyways, it's been a long journey. Pretty soon, the lights will be even crazier than they were before. Anyways.